So uh, you've sent us a file that was designed in SolidWorks, and as you uh, prefer to use our standalone system, uh, we will look at uh, how we can bring that CAD model that you built in SolidWorks into our standalone product, okay? Okay. So there are several ways you can export your file. Uh, you can use uh, STEP, IGES, uh, Parasolid. Uh, you can even do uh, a SAT file format. So we read different wide range of file formats in uh, Visual CAD CAM. So um, you see that I have the application loaded on my screen? Yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so what I'm gonna do here is go into the open uh, dialog on my screen, which is over on the home tab on the CAD ribbon interface. So Visual CAD offers you a basic set of CAD tools, which you can use for quickly creating some geometries like curves, uh, you know, lines and arcs, points. You can do some curve editing, trimming. You can do some basic surface modeling, some solid modeling and mesh modeling too. So this is not a a replacement for your mainstream CAD system, which could be SolidWorks or in any of the CAD system that you're using. This is basically something that will help you create, maybe add some holes or make some, uh, you know, create some geometries that will help you in the machining process. Now, the file translators, what's supported by Visual CAD, or you can bring in, uh, you know, DXF, DWG files, IGES, you can bring in uh, mesh models like OBJs, you can bring parasolids, point clouds, native Rhino files, SAT files, SketchUp, you can see STEP, STL, so we have a whole bunch of file formats available in here. So uh, what I've done here is I've exported your file out from SolidWorks as a STEP. I just did it a couple of minutes ago before the demo. So I'm gonna select the STEP file that you had uh, sent us as a SolidWorks file. So I convert it to a STEP and I'm gonna select open and in this process, it's gonna basically translate the file and bring it into Visual CAD. So you could choose uh, from one of the different, uh, you know, export options in SolidWorks and export the file. So I just chose the standard step format. And here I can switch from one view to the other. So I'm just gonna switch to the uh, isometric view and you can see that uh, the part uh, looks like you have a multi-body part in here, is that right? Yes. Okay, uh, does it look like the part that you had modeled and does the translation exporting everything looks correct in here? Yep. Okay, so Visual CAD offers you all the graphical tools for viewing, view rotations, you can go to like a multi-view layout. So take a look at it from the multiple views like top, front. You can also resize the views. Uh, there's all the controls for zooming in, zooming out, and also we support uh, uh, like a, a 3D navigation tool which like a 3D mouse, you can call it, so you can use for viewing and rotation as well. Okay? Okay. Now, uh, if you look under the display tab, you have access to different uh, you know, display controls like pan, zoom, or you can even use your uh, controls in here, uh, right mouse button click uh, to rotate a view. You can use the control and right click to do a dynamic zoom, shift and right click to do a pan as well. So all of these controls are available to you in Visual CAD and you can choose from display styles, uh, wireframe, you can go to shaded displays, all of these controls. They can also be accessed through the heads up display toolbar right across the top. And of course you have drawing tools where you can do, uh, you know, create your construction plane, uh, if you, you know, which is basically similar to what you call a, a sketch plane in SolidWorks. We call it a C plane or a construction plane where you can orient the construction plane to a given view or any rotation to create geometries in CAD. And we have drawing tools, uh, you know, similar to your sketching tools, we have 2D curve modeling tools. We have some basic surfacing tools. We do not get into any uh, filleting of surfaces or chamfering or trimming of surfaces in the CAD modeling. We can do still do filleting uh, in the toolpath in general when you generate toolpaths in your CAM product. And of course we have some solid modeling, mesh modeling, basic dimensioning tools. So all of these and analysis tools to measure dimensions or take some measurements, check the diameter, check the size and all the stuff. In the curve modeling tab, we also have some curve extraction tools. So um, now let's get started in the demo here. And how would you like to uh, machine this part? Okay, um, I'd like to hide Hide all of them except for uh, let's 
let's do the punch, the very top uh, part there. Okay, you want to do the very top part and hide the rest. Is that correct? Well, no, I changed my mind. Let's do the very bottom part, but it looks like okay. you got an extra bit of stuff so we can hide like the the one, two, three, the top four bodies. Okay. So I'll go into the front view so it makes it easier for me to pick all of these right there. Okay. okay. Yep. And then what I'll do is I'll just place them on to a another layer in here. So I'll just move them on to, uh, you know, I'll just say I want to move it from the layer it's currently on, uh, which is basically level zero. Uh, and then I'll just put it on the default layer and then I can hide the default layer. So basically, ah. you're only looking at the visibility of, uh, you know, uh, this particular layer, which shows it has about uh, four different objects in here. You have one right here. Yeah. Uh, so you have uh, one over here, and, I, and then I can say, you know, I can say, select these two. If I hide them, I can temporarily hide these here, and I'll see the other two pieces in here as well. Okay. Let's let's hide what you have visible there, and okay. then we'll go back. Go back okay. to what you have. All right. I'll take these and I'll put them back into so I can right click and go to properties and just say I want to move them from level zero to the default layer. And now I've hidden them. Then I can say show the other ones we hit so that makes the rest of it visible here. Okay. So now if you click on the, the ring on the, the, the top here where you're there, hide that one. And okay. then we'll machine which. All right, so I'll move this also back to default layer. So there we go. We got the part. Okay, perfect. So you can see how easy the tools are for navigation inside of Visual CAD, and it brings it in the same orientation the way you have it modeled. So you're looking down from the top, you have your front, right side isometric. You can also split the views, you can add additional views as well. And you can hide okay. or close these uh, browsers for the layer manager, and you can just access them right from the status bar anytime you wish to. Now, as far as the CAM interface goes, uh, Visual CAD CAM is our standalone product. So we use what is called a plugin architecture, where Visual CAM runs as a plugin inside of our homegrown Visual CAD. So even though we call it a standalone product, we use what is called a plugin architecture. So when you install it, it's just single one single product. As a user standpoint, you wouldn't see any difference. It's just one single package. So internally, it's uh, developed as a using a plugin architecture. So you have the mill module. Uh, that's the one that you're looking at over here. So when this is active, you'll see the CAM interface for machining. You have the machining browser over here in the top half, and then the machining objects browser over down in the bottom half of your screen. The machining browser has two main tabs. You have the program tab and the simulate tab, and then the objects browser has tools, machining regions. You can create features, knowledge bases. So basically, you work your way left to right as you work through each of these on the machining browser. So the first time uh, you start out with is you define your machining process, whether you're going to be working out on a two-axis, three-axis, four- or five-axis application. So you pick the number of axes you're going to be using for programming this part. So for two- and three-axis, you would leave it as three. Uh, the professional configuration includes index and continuous four-axis. It goes all the way up to three-plus-two machining, or also known as index five-axis machining. So if you just have a three-axis route, and you need to machine the part from multiple orientations, you can do it with the Pro by creating multiple setups. But if the router is capable of five axis, then you know you can orient the head to different orientations and then machine them from different planes or different orientations as well. So that's what's called three plus two machining or index five axis. Okay. Now, if your ma machine tool that you have has a automatic tool changer, uh, you know, we automatically output tool changes and it calls out, you know, the tool number and then whatever your code like M6 or whatever it is to call up the tool. If you're working off of a manual tool changer, you can use the additional option to specify a tool change point. So it just basically moves the tool to that specific XYZ coordinate location. So it just makes it easier for the operator to swap the tools out without having to use the control to go ahead and jog it back to, a, you know, like a specific location. Right. Okay. All right. So we've defined the machine. In the next step, you can select the uh, post processor. This would be the machine tool that you would like to generate your NC files or the G code output files for. And from your notes, I see that uh, you mentioned about an Axis AXYZ router. Yeah, that's one of them we write for. Okay. So we do have uh, several different posts for Axis router. So 
Uh, if it's using the A2MC controller, you can pick that one. It's just standard Axis router, you can select this. And all our posts are fully editable and customizable. So we have a post generator interface that, that's included directly in the software. Uh, we can help you make any changes, edits. Uh, we can. That's how we write new posts, customize it. So we will be able to support, uh, you know, machines that read standard GNM codes or ISO G codes. We can create new posts, do a save as, uh, you know, give it a new name, or we can call it Rev1 if you want a few subtle changes put on this here. For example, I can uh, bump up the maximum spindle speed of the machine. I could say this machine can go up to 30,000 RPM, or the feed rate can be set to maybe I can go up to 800 inches per minute, for example. I can set my low values in here. So each of these parameters can be set, customized, the startup block, the tool chain macros, all of these can be updated right in here. Perfect. And you can have multiple uh, variations of the same post created and they'll all appear in the list or you can save it in like a shareable folder. So if you have multiple users trying to use the software from different computers, uh, you can have it in a common place where everybody has access to the same post processor. Okay. And um, the uh, posted file extension, you can specify it to be nc.cnc.txt.tab, whatever is the flavor of the extension that your machine or controller expects. The content of the file will still be the same, it's just the extension will be different. That would be uh, most ideal for your machine tool. Okay. And by default, we'll uh, display the code in a notepad, which could be a text editor. If you're using your own NC editor, if you have one, you can just have it point to that executable file and it'll just basically preview or display it once it's posted in that particular application. Oh, great, good, okay. Okay, all right. So uh, we've defined a machine, we've selected the post processor in here. In the next step, uh, you know, before we define our stock, we want to make sure that the part is in the intended orientation for machining. Uh, typically on routers, uh, you know, you may have more travel on the Y axis. Most routers are built that way, but some routers have more travel on the X. So by looking at the part, looking down on the, uh, from the top view, you want to determine if the part, the way it's currently oriented, will it fit into the envelope, work envelope of your router. So if I go in and check uh, the uh, create light to define a stock in here, it gives me a length, uh, which is the distance on the X axis is about 35 inches, uh, close to 36 inches, and the width was about uh, 20 inches, and the height or thickness is about 1.085. So uh, would you like to go ahead uh, with this orientation, or do you want to have the part rotated so it fits better on your router? That's something you want to determine at this point of time, just to make it easier for your programming workflow. No, this is fine, but is when we're, we're dealing with this stock box, what I do is put the part like 50,000 below, like the highest part of the part, about 50,000 below. Um, like say it's a one inch thick piece of plastic we're gonna machine this out of. Um, okay. And I want the part to be like 50,000 below the top surface of that one inch. Okay, all right, so the stock uh, is 1.085. So you said you're gonna be using a one inch stock? Oh, that's the height of the part? Okay, yeah, let's that's the height use, of the uh, part. Okay, let's use a one and a half inch stock, and then okay. let's put let's place the uh, uh, the part fifty thousandths from the, below the surface of the stock. I can certainly do that. Now, how about your length and the width? Uh, let's put uh, three quarters of an inch extra on all sides. Okay, so one of the nicer ways we could do it here is. Um, you could uh, either use um, a you know a box stock where you can define the length, width, and the height, or you could do like a part box stock where you can just specify an offset in each axis x, y, and z. So here you said you want to do three quarter inch on each side, right? Is that correct? Right. Yep. So I'm going to add an inch and a half. So basically it'll add three quarters for each side. I'm going to do the same thing. Okay. I'll say plus add inch and a half. So that basically is three quarters times two, and then I'll leave this as a 1.5 and I'll pick OK here, and you'll notice that the stock is now larger than the part, and it's basically, right now it's locked to the lower left corner, so if you want to do what is called an align stock, so right now in the align stock, I'm going to have it flush to the center in X and Y, and right now the top of the stock is flush to the top of the part, so we'll lower the part down by 50 thousandths in the Z once we've done this step, okay? Okay. 
All right, now this is one of the ways to do it. Uh, there are several other ways you can do it here. Um, one of the other possible ways I could think of is I can uh, create a, a small uh, line or a surface that's 50,000 thick, and I can uh, basically use that R. The simplest way is select the entire part and I can transform it or I can use what is called a graphical manipulator in here. I can just pick the Z axis arrow and say I wanna drop it down by minus 50,000. So it's basically going to drop the top face of the stock down. So the part is 50,000 below the top surface of the stock. Okay. All right. Any questions so far, sir? Looks good. Okay. So now if you hit save, it'll automatically save all of this information to your uh, uh, file. Uh, you can pick a folder where you want this to be saved. So I can pick the hit the save button in here. I can just go pick a folder uh, where I would like this to be saved. I'm just going to hit save button right there. So it saves this in a visual CAD file format. And uh, when you reload this part, all of this information will be loaded back. So the stocks that you define, uh, the tool, the feeds and speed, sorry, the uh, machine definition, uh, the post processor, all of this is basically saved. In the next step, we want to establish our XYZ origin. Uh, this we call this as either you can do it in a couple of different ways. We can move the entire stock and the part to the origin location. So basically everything gets translated or transformed. Or we can use a feature called Work Zero, which allows you to actually move the coordinate system origin for machining to any specific location on the stock. So you can pick whether you want to put it to like a southwest corner, top of the stock material, or bottom in the Z. So you can pick where you want to put the XYZ origin. Would you have a preference on where you'd like to put it? Uh, since we're doing the XYZ, let's go to the, the bottom of the stock in the southwest okay. corner. Okay, lower Z, southwest. So if I take a look yep. at it from the front view, you'll see that it's going to be set right here. Now the CAD world coordinate system origin still remains here. We're just moving the origin for machining over here. So this could be like, and some machine tools could be like a G54, your work offset if the controller would like to use a G54, you can enable that right here and then pick generate. So now your machining origin is over here. Your CAD origin still remains. We do also have the option where you move the entire part and the stock to the world coordinate origin as well. So you have the choice of how you want to do it. Okay. Well, this okay. looks good. The, the, the CAD origin is um, uh, really not, doesn't matter, right, at this point? That is correct, because all the tool paths you generate will be referenced off, the coordinates will be referenced off this particular point. Okay. All right. Okay. So yep. next we are ready to program some tool paths. So if you want to define some tools, you can see that I currently have a library of tools created in here. Uh, so Visual Mill supports different types of tools, starting with ball mills, flat mills, corner radius, tools for engraving, chamfer, taper, thread mills, face mill, dovetail cutters, fillet mill tools, lollipop cutters. You can also do form tools, so you can basically draw the profile of the tool, one half of the profile, and then we can revolve it here to define as a tool. And then you have drill, center drill, reamer, tap, bore, and reverse bore. Each of these tool tabs can be defined, and you can see that I have different sizes for the tools defined by defining the tool uh, you know, dimensions in here. If the tool is being previewed, you can set your tool numbers that maps up to your automatic tool changer, select the material type for your tool. If you're doing any metal working, you can also pick the coolant types. You can input any comments like where you source your tools. This can be output in the code. And of course, you can set your feeds and speeds. Uh, the feeds and speeds can also be uh, determined based on the material you're working with. So we have a handful of materials in the list. The list can be customized to add additional material types and based on the material that you pick and the information that you specified for the surface feed and the feed per tooth, uh, you know, we have a built-in feeds and speeds calculator in here and this can help you recommend determine feeds and speeds. So you can also put in the what is the maximum RPM of your machine tool, maximum cut feeder your machine tool can handle. So all of this can be input right in here. So and then this will help you determine your feeds and speeds. Okay. Okay. All right, so you can go about defining each and every tool type in here for each tools right there, flat mill, ball mill, you can do that. So I currently have a library of tools defined in here and it'll automatically load the last loaded tool library. You can have one or more libraries. You can share the tool library put on a uh, like you know shareable folder so all, you, all of your programmers can have access to the same library. If you wanna make a change, uh, update, you update it and just go back and resave it like how you resave a document. Okay. Okay.
Any questions so far? Um, like, say, uh, can we analyze or, or measure the model, like, you know, find a, a radius point or something so it can help me determine what what is the proper tool to, you know, what would be the best tool to machine this with? Absolutely, we can do that. So, for example, uh, we have different uh, analysis tool here. I can do analyze, and I can say I want to measure, like, a three vertex diameter, and I can uh, choose, like, uh, object snaps in here. I can say I want to measure, use the near snap. I'm going to go over here, and you can see that I'm measuring just, like, a three-point arc. It says that's 1.29. Or I can go over here say three vertex diameter in here again, and I can just pick three points right here, 5.238. Uh, we can also measure, extract some curve from the model. That's a nice tool here. I can go into the curve extraction tools. I can also use layers similar to how we have layering in other CAD systems. I can insert a new layer. I can assign a different color for the layer. And I can go ahead and extract some curves. I can say I want to extract curves that are on this particular face. And when I do that, it automatically creates these geometries. It says it's a circle. So when I pick the circle, I can go to analyze and say arc diameter, it tells me that it's 0.3125 in diameter. So I can extract, uh, I can also identify the center point for the circle. If I hover the cursor, use the object snap and pick center, and I can measure the center of the circle. So we have, uh, you know, standard measurement tools. Uh, I can measure distance between two centers, arc centers. I could say I want to measure between this over here and this over here, and it tells me the distance between the two arc centers is 2.886. Okay. Okay. So you have now, tools for measurement. Okay. Go ahead. Um, this this base here. Um, do you see my cursor moving? Uh, I will go ahead and uh, give you access to drive my computer, and you will be able to move the cursor in here as well. Okay. Okay. Right in here. Mm -hmm. um, can we figure out the, the width here? Absolutely. Um, uh, so what I'm going to use is a tool called distance, minimum d distance between two points. And I can use um, what is called a near object snap. So snap to two points that are close enough right here, one and two. So that's about 0.189. So if you have um, a three... 316 bit, uh, you might be able to get in there, or maybe you can go slightly smaller than that. So you do distance okay. measurement. You can pick two points near these two, and you'll see the you know distance between the two points that you picked in the right above the command window. Okay, good. All right. All right. Okay. So uh, are we ready to start uh, putting some toolpaths on this part here? Sure. Uh, you know when we were zoomed in, I thought was faceted is that just a display thing or, uh, or is part it... of it is a display and part of it is also how we uh, translated the file in so we have controls to uh, you know tighten the faceting tolerance though so the smaller the number you put in it brings in a much it brings it in a much tighter accuracy so you can tighten this up when you read it in so when you bring in the step file so this was the default tolerance in here so we can tighten it up further and bring it in as well oh, okay Okay, right. so you have control for this. And also the display can do flat shading or smooth shading. So if you switch to smooth shading, display looks a lot smoother. Uh, if you put it to flat shading, you'll see if there are any facets. Then you can go back when you re-import it. You can bring it with a much tighter tolerance. Okay. Okay. And that's really just what you display right there. Okay, uh, well, this will be what you see when you machine it, actually. So you want to go back and oh. import it with a much tighter tolerance. Okay, very good. So I can okay. change this back from a 2,000 to a 1 10 thousandths of a tolerance, and then I can bring it in. So okay. it'll, you know, reduce those facets, make it much to make them much smaller. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Now I had a question. See what we do. What we've, you know, we've got a huge library of parts that we've done, and we save it as the SolidWorks, and then we also save it as a Parasolid, uh, one for redundancy and also so we can bring that into other uh, CAM software. And mm -hmm. um, when I brought up, and we have to use like version 15, so it's not the most, you know, up-to-date Parasolid. But mm -hmm. when I brought it into my demo mode, it took quite a long time, like maybe five minutes for it to load in. 
and mm-hmm. it had a couple of art. It had a couple of artifacts, like it just had like a stray vector line in there, and you know I didn't try to machine it. I don't know if it would affect it or not. Um, but see that the nice thing, because there's more than just one person machining this, you know. So if I design something and then save it as a parasolid, I'd like to stay with that format. So it could be machined by any of the CAM software that's available to us, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we um, do read parasolids, but if there is an ins- issue that you run into in terms of translation, uh, you know, I would definitely r- recommend using one of the other export formats, which could be STEP. Uh, you know, STEP also has, uh, STEP is a more recent format over IGES, so you could use STEP, that's what I did here. So, but you know, if you can, you can, you're welcome to send us the, uh, we can take a look at the Parasolid file and see uh, what could be causing the issue and uh, we can probably have it, uh, you know, have development le- review that and see uh, if there's something they can do to uh, improve that. Okay, I guess, you know, it's not a, a big deal. I just, I try to, Continue the the current mm-hmm. workflow. You know? Okay. Yes, yeah, uh, would work. Uh, you know, if you have an issue with one translation, sometimes it could be some geometry specific that could be causing it. And you know, uh, you know, to uh, eliminate that, I would recommend trying one of the other formats. Maybe you can have a step and Parasolid exported out and saved in your you know folders. So if there is an issue with Parasolid, then at least you have a fallback plan to use step. Okay. Okay, now let's go ahead and look at some of the tools. So I see that you had sent me some summary of tools. Your three quarter inch uh, tool was a uh, tool number seven in here. So I have a three quarter inch end mill. I can just go up and go ahead and change the tool numbers, your uh, you know height offset register. And then if you wanna do a diameter or cut a compensation, you can set those and you can just update the tool library in here. You can also change the name of the tool. You can add comments in here. Uh, so you can put all this information right there. So that's how easy it is to update your tools. Now let's go ahead and start okay. some, uh, you know, tool pads in here. We'll do a facing operation or a roughing operation to start with, right? You want to face this entire block, or we could just face just the boundary around the part in here to bring it down to this uh, height, right? There's different ways we can do it. So if you just want to face it down on this area, we will go into what's called two axis. Uh, we have different methods available, starting with roughing, facing, pocketing, profiling, all the way up to remachining in two axis. Uh, in the Pro, you also have remachining in two axis. Uh, that's one of the added features of the benefits of the Pro. In three axis, you have access to all of the advanced 3D methods in the Pro. Uh, the standard and expert are limited to five different types of 3D methods. The four axis methods are included in the Pro. Uh, you also have access to whole machining. The simultaneous five axis is not in the Pro. You can still do index five axis where you can do positional or three plus two machining. And the Pro also includes uh, fixture offset programming. You can do instancing where you can basically have uh, like a pattern of these parts, like an XY instance of these parts created. So you just program tool paths in one and then you instance the rest. Okay. Okay. So uh, we'll start with the facing operation in here. So you can do two axis and facing. And over here, in two axis operations, in most operations, you have to pick a, a geometry or a feature, like a part region that you want to machine. So I could say select curve regions. I can just go grab this uh, boundary here. I can either select a edge from the solid model, or I can, since I have a curve, I can just pick that one right there. That's selected. Right click to accept your selections. You can go pick a tool. So I could say you want to use a face mill cutter. If you have a, a face mill, you can use that, or you just want to use a three quarter inch end mill. You can use a three quarter inch end mill. Set your feeds and speeds. You can put in the clearance. You can see when you select the clearance tab, it automatically displays the safe plane, safety plane. And you can change this height in here if you wanted to have any, you know, if you don't have a vacuum holding, you have some clamps, you want to clear it further higher up, you can say you want to go three quarters inch above the stock. They can set the clearance height. And then in the roughing, you can specify your roughing parameters. How do you want the, uh, uh, you know, cut patterns to be in the, uh, uh, facing operation, you can go linear, you can do island offset cut pattern, you can specify like a step over in here, you can control the cut depths. So you could say you want to start uh, at the uh, top of the stock and go down. So you want to start at inch and a half, go down 50 thousands, or here I can just say my depth is 50 thousands uh, and not cut below this area in here. Set my entry and exit to do a lead in and lead out, how you want the cutter to lead in, lead out. You can specify all of those parameters in here. You can also do arc fitting on the tool pads, uh, so it'll output GO2s or GO3s and generate get your facing tool pads. I can see I chose the offset pattern 
and it's entering from the side over here. So when you go to the simulate tab, you can run a verification and it's only cutting around the contour of the shape, not the entire rectangular sheet. So we can also do the cut the entire rectangular sheet as well. Okay. So at any time can we you can, heal uh, coil in? I'm sorry? Can we heal the coil in or ramp in or? Yeah, so what I did here was uh, I used just a uh, linear entry in here uh, for the facing. I could go back and edit the facing parameters. I can choose a long path and I can specify an angle and a height on the facing. So it basically comes uh, in down at an angle right there on the facing. Okay. In the case of pocketing, you can do a ramp, helical ramp, linear ramps, there's different types in here. In the facing operation, it's either like a 2D entry or you could do a, um, a long path ramp on the facing. Okay. You can anytime do a pause, simulate to end, that gives you the simulation of the facing. And we can also apply different colors uh, you can apply based on each operation. You can specify a color for the simulation. So just way it makes it easier for you to view and analyze it here. So you can see that for the facing, I picked the color. When you go back and run the simulation, you can see the color changes as the cut material color. Okay. Any questions so far? No, we're good. Okay, perfect. So then the next step, you want to go ahead and take care of machining these holes in here. Uh, I know we measured the diameter of the holes. Uh, these were, uh, if I go back and verify it here, analyze uh, the arc diameter, they were 0.3125. So would you have a drill bit of that size or you would you do like a pocket machining or how would you like to go about machining those? Uh, we would would drill it uh, probably like 3 sixteenths or something and then after it was machined, just for hold down purposes if we wanted okay. to. We do, have a, we do have a vacuum table on that one, but just anything, and then we would just manually blow it out okay. to the proper. So we can go ahead and use a hole machining, a drilling operation in here. And sure. um, I can actually uh, use select drill points and circles. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, choose uh, here. I can say select by layer. And I'm going to just grab this layer in here. It picks all the geometries that are on the layer. I only want to pick the holes in circles. I can put in a filter in here saying only pick all the holes that are up to 0.32. So it automatically filters out the rest. I have 11 holes selected. I can go ahead and pick a tool for it here. So I can say I want to use a quarter inch drill, for example, right? Or I can even use an yep. end mill for drilling. I don't have to go with a drill bit. If I want to use a quarter inch end mill, I can just go ahead and say, this is the uh, end mill that, you, that I would like to use. It's a carbide end mill set the tool number as to uh, specify the material here, do a save it as the tool, and I can use this tool for my drilling operation, uh, set my feed speeds, clearance, in a cut parameters, I can choose what I want to do standard drill or like a deep drill, which is like a peck drill or brake chip. We have different drill types. You can specify the depth that you want to drill. So since this is a through, I can actually pick the depth from the 3D model. So I can just pick two points, a point near the top edge, a point anywhere near the bottom edge, uh, measures the total height right there, and I can say I want to um, go past. If you had the if you had a drill bit, then you want a tip to clear. You can say add tool tip to drill depth. In this case, there's no tip because it's a flat end mill. Uh, so I'm not going to select that option. Then sorting, you can specify how you want to go in the sequence. I can say starting from the lower left corner, and that basically produces your drilling tool path. It goes in a sequence from one to the other. Now again, you can go yep. to the simulate tab. Uh, you can apply a different uh, color by going to properties in here for the drilling and I'm going to pick a different color in here. I'll just pick blue and pick simulate. So you can see the holes are now being drilled right in here. And depending on the thickness, okay. since the stock is inch and a half thick and we left only 50 thousandths above, so we're not going all the way through as you see it. So if you want to go all the way through, I can go back in here and change my depth to 1.5 minus 50 thousandths, right? Yep. It's be 1.45, and I updated the toolpath, and now you'll notice that it is going to go all the way through, as you see it in the bottom. Yep. yep. All right. So the drilling is done. The next step is basically you want to uh, mill the, uh, the, or the pocket, the areas on the inside out, right? Yep. So there are different ways you can do it. Uh, since you have some uh, radii in these areas, you can do a three axis operation, or if you just want to do like a two and a half D operation, you can do a two and a half axis. I would probably do a three axis, like a Z level uh, or a horizontal roughing operation in here. So just going to three axis, start with the roughing process, 
And again, I can pick a boundary in here. I could say this is the area I would like to keep my cutter inside. So the toolpath tool will stay completely inside this. I can specify a tool that I would like to use for it. Uh, I can start with a half an inch end mill or a three quarter end mill to start with. Would you have a preference? Let's go. Um, how we do is we go as big as fast as we can. We do uh, like a high speed uh, strategy. And so we helicoil in to like within, you know, 20 thousandths, 50 thousandths of the final surface mm -hmm. and then rough it at like 48 percent to 600 inches or and something. what tool would you like to use for it sir three quarter three quarter okay so we'll pick the three quarter uh, we'll set the cut parameters here so here in the cutting conditions you have uh, core and cavity regions you can pick the cut pattern if you want to do the high speed cut pattern which uses uh -huh. constant tangential arc so it basically the tool path what it forms is a tangential arc rather than using an offset pattern and uh, it right. allows you to run it at how much higher feed rates prolongs your tool life. So I'll show you the offset and then we'll switch over to high speed as well. You can see the difference between the two methods. And then you can specify okay. your uh, cut level containments uh, where you can specify uh, how fine you want the cutter to step in the Z. You can also control your step overs right in here. You can specify whether you want to go like 48% or 50% or you know whatever the step over that you want to put in the tool diameter and step down how much of until you want to take down per pass. I could say 30% or 40%, right? So for example, I could say 40% of my tool diameter is how much I want to remove per cut. Uh, specify the engage and retract where you can do a helical in uh, for the pocket. You can specify a radius for the helix. You can give it a height in here uh, for the helical height and then the angle that you want to use. And then you can also apply arc fitting to the tool patch in here. Uh, we have controls for all of these and then you pick generate so in this process it's actually going to compute a three axis roughing toolpath which takes into account the part and the stock and it creates a toolpath right there that's your offset cut pattern as you notice it right there okay now um silly question if uh, the the z depth if i put in just like 0.8 and but it would look at a solid model no it will look it will be looking at the solid model so it can go past that yeah. the distance and it's uh, it's not going to be able to do it uh, we, you know, if you want to do like a 2D pocket operation, then uh, we can specify the depth and how far we want it to go. So, for example, if I say two axis pocket machining and I can say this is the I want to just pick that area right there. Right. That's the area you want to pocket. And I can also go ahead and pick this inside area in here as well. I can pick this one and this one as well. I can do a pocket by selecting all these three areas, use a three quarter inch tool. I can specify. Um, and say I want to leave stock maybe 25,000 from the sides, use a cutting pattern in here. Now here I can specify the depth. Cut levels, I could say I want to start at this particular height, and that's where I would like to start. And then I want to go from here down to the bottom edge. So that's about 0.335, and if you go put in deeper, it'll be cutting deeper than this, because oh, you're using, it will. Uh, well, when you do 2D operation, because you're manually setting the depth how deep you want to cut. If you do a three-axis operation, the depth is determined based on the model automatically. Okay. You have control. If you want to go slightly deeper, you can do that. If you want to break it in multiple steps, you can absolutely do it. And you can control all of these settings here. You can say you want to ramp. You can specify your uh, radius. You can specify the height. You can specify the angle. You can apply these for each cut level. And of course, you can do true arc fitting in here as well and then generate the path. So that will give you a two axis operation. So you can see that this is a 2D operation and this one is a three axis operation. So in 3D, it's automatically determining all of the uh, you know, parameters. In two axis, you can manually specify how deep you want to cut. So you have all of the control. Now, if you want to change this from a offset cut pattern, so this we call this an offset pattern. We also have what is called a high-speed pattern in here, high-speed cut pattern, uh, which basically generates constant tangential arcs. You can apply the high-speed cut pattern as well. So this allows you to run at a much higher feed rates. And there's your high-speed cutting pattern right there. Okay. And if for any reason it's too tight, the cutter can get in there, you'll notice that the tool is not able to get into those areas in either a high-speed cut pattern or one of the other patterns. Right. So you fine. can see the nice um, tangential arcs being generated right in here. Okay, so it's, it looks like it's set to either climb or or conventional. It doesn't zigzag or 
Yeah, so in the high-speed cut pattern, you have the option to either do climb or conventional only. If you pick the offset pattern, then you can do mixed, and uh, okay. you can use the mixed cut pattern in the offset okay. pattern or linear pattern. So this here, it's doing a mixed cut pattern as you go between one to the other. So let me go ahead and run a verification, and we could take a look at it. So I'm going to do a uh, simulate. Before I do that, I'll just apply a different color for the simulation just to make it easier. I'll put in lime as the color, hit play, and you'll notice that the pockets are being machined, and it automatically creates a ramp for each of those areas. And it's doing a mixed cut pattern. Okay. And any time you can do a pause, pick simulate to end. Now you are okay. noticing that there are some areas where the pocket was unable to, or the tool was unable to cut machine those pockets. Now for those areas uh, with the pro, you can use this method called uh, two axis and remachining over here. And I can okay. select the same set of boundaries. So in this example, I'm just using flat areas. I could have extracted some curves as well. Now I can go from a three quarter inch to maybe a quarter inch tool right, to clean up some of those tighter yep. areas. And then use okay. the same type of uh, parameters in here. Specify the stock to leave. You can specify the previous reference operation as a pocketing. We used a three quarter inch tool, or if I wanna have a little bit of overlap, I can say I wanna put in maybe 0.8, add 50,000 slack to it. Specify my step over in here, uh, cut direction, cut levels. You just wanna do it in one cut. I can say it's at the bottom what I chose. You can also apply the entry and exit. You can do a long path ramps wherever you need to. And you can also do uh, arc fitting in here as well. So it'll generate true arcs. So now when I generate this tool path, it's gonna to create a remachining operation. And it looks at the areas where the previous cutter could not get in there. And it generates okay. a tool path for those areas. Now, what okay. you're noticing here is, um, you know, it's creating those tool paths in those areas and it's cleaning them up for you. And you can also specify where you want to begin the cuts, how far you want it to go. You can, uh, you know, you can display the tool paths right there, what you're seeing. You can go back in here, make any changes that you need to. Like, for example, you want to change some of the parameters in here. You can, you know, update it. And you can always go back and regenerate the tool paths in here. Now, on the pocketing operation, I did leave some stock over there. So I can go back and clean that up as well. Or if you just want to run a profile operation in here, you can do it as well. So if I go back into this operation in here in the pocket, I have set a stock to leave of 25,000. So I can zero it out. So it probably will be able to get even closer to the geometry in a lot of these areas, as you noticed it. Okay. All right? <clears throat> yeah. It's yeah. So if you want to use machining regions, you can go to the curve tab. You can extract these regions from the model. I can pick a face so it'll extract the regions from the 3D model. I can do the same thing by picking this one here and also picking this one here. So now on the remachining operation, I can go back and say, rather than picking a flat area, I can pick these curve regions around here for the remachining tool path. So you can see there's different ways how you can select your boundaries for machining. So you can either pick uh, curve areas right here as I'm selecting it. So you can see in this case, I had to go and select curves around each of these regions, right? So I can mm -hmm. place them on a different layer and I could do what is called select by You know, select by layer. And you can select all of those geometries right there, as I just did. Okay. I can go back and also add additional geometries in here. So that gives you the control. Over here, you can pick a tool. You want to go with a half an inch, a quarter inch, or I can even go with a one eighth inch cutter. I can specify where I want to begin my cuts. So very similar to what we did in the previous operation, go from here down to this level, right? So okay. I can specify each of the parameters and then pick generate. Uh, that'll create the tool path. So to go and clean up those areas where the previous cutter could not get into. So you can use a remachining operation for that. You can also have the control to suppress operations. So you do suppress, you can suppress it. Or if you wanna go back and use a smaller tool, or you could even do like a three axis operation in here to go back and clean up some of the areas. So if you wanna do a 3D approach, 
I can use a 3D approach, uh, three axis method instead of using a two and a half axis operation in here, where I can specify the, the tolerances, the stock to leave over here. I can also do what's called a, a cleanup of the flats in here. And um, I can specify the top where I want to begin my cutting from. So the 3D gives you automatic control for establishing all the parameters in here, uh, where you don't have to go back and uh, set any of the, uh, you know, you don't have to pick the depth and all that stuff. And this gives you a lot of nice controls. So you can start with a three axis. You don't have to do a two axis operation. You can go directly with a three axis operation. Okay. So now I'm finishing. Can I uh, tell the tool to remain down? Yeah, so we have uh, in the operations in the roughing, we have the option to do a cleanup pass and always keep the cutter down. So it'll do uh, the best possible okay. not to uh, retract the cutter when you go from one area to the other. Right, okay. So it'll do its best. If it's possible to find a route uh, to make it, it'll, you know, when areas get pinched out, it'll try to keep the cutter within the same area and not avoid the retracts wherever it's feasible. Okay. If it has to retract, it'll do the minimum retract and then it'll again ramp back in as you're seeing it. So over here, I did a roughing operation. Now, uh, the beauty of the three axis methods is after you do a roughing, I can go back and do what is called a three axis uh, re-roughing. So very similar to how we did remachining in two and a half axis, we have re-roughing in three axis. I can go with a smaller tool, a quarter inch or one eighth inch end mill. I can specify my parameters in here. I could say, now I want to take it to uh, leave the same amount of stock in here, uh, use the same cut patterns, what I had, uh, do a cleanup pass as well. And then in the cut levels, I could specify uh, the depth control. So where I want it to start, um, I can specify that. And I can say, I want to do a cleanup of the flat as well and do uh, additional cut parameters in here. So this will allow me to go back and machine only the areas that were uncut. So if you look at the roughing operation we did here, there were some areas that the cutter could not get in, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So I can go back and re-rough it with a smaller tool. So this will automatically take that into account. Great. So we can't currently do that. Uh, in your system, the one that you're working with. So here you can see that you can do, go back and do a re-roughing. You can also do um, not do the cleanup of the flats, and we can use a different technique to do a cleanup of the flats in here as well. So there's a lot of control available, as you see right there. Okay. And you can do a simulate to end, which runs through the simulation. And you can see how nicely it cleaned it up for you right there. Okay, so the next step is you want to do a finishing. So you can either do a combination of uh, like 2D methods, like profiling or, you know, uh, profiling to clean up around the wall. So I can use a two axis and I do a profile uh, to have it automatically go around the, uh, the walls of the part. So for example, to select those features, I can actually uh, just hide the model in here and do a select by dragging a window around it. So I can choose, uh, basically it says select the curves. I would like to machine. And I'm going to just drag a window to select all of these in here and drop the ones I don't want it to be used or participated in machining. So I'm going to pick these areas in here and select those. So I have those selected now. I can use the uh, smaller tool, the quarter inch tool, and I can do a profile cut. I can do climb or mixed cut, choose inside or outside or here. I'm going to say determine the side to cut based on the 3D model. So it automatically figures out which side to place the cutter. And I can specify multiple depths if necessary, specify the ramp, and do arc fitting and apply a sorting to use the minimum distance. So in this technique, you're basically running a profile cut to go around and clean up around each of those areas automatically. And you have the control, the finest control that you need in here. So you see that it goes around and does a profile. And you can always set the depth, all the parameters in here. You can go back, edit the operation, cut levels. You could say you want to start over here. And then you want to go from here down to this bottom edge. And you can break it up into multiple passes if you need to, or just do it in one cut. So that gives you all of the detailed control to go about machining it.
So that gives you the profile pass around it. Now, if you want to change the tool, if you feel that a quarter inch, you want to use a 1.8, you just take the tool, drag and drop it on the operation, right click and regenerate it. Your tool paths are now updated. You can go back and rerun the verification. So that's how easy it is to work with it. Good. All right. So now let's take a look at uh, how we can machine uh, uh, these uh, sculpted areas, or sculpted features. So we can do different techniques. We can start with a, a Z-level operation. We call it a horizontal finishing operation. I could use that to start with it. I can just pick a boundary and say pick a uh, machine all the steep areas inside the section, and we can go with the radius tool. So we can use a quarter inch or one eighth inch uh, ball nose cutter. So I can use a quarter inch ball mill. And I see that you have one uh, which has a, um, you say you have a bull nose cutter. So I'm going to call this a corner radius. That's what we call a bull nose. It's a corner radius tool. And you're, uh, you have a 0.06 corner radius in here. And I'm going to specify this tool right there. And I can specify a tool number for it that matches uh, what you have in your tool changer. So this will be tool four. And I can do a save as new tool. The tool is defined. I can use uh, the cut conditions where you can specify your cut levels. Uh, you can specify uh, cut containments. So you can control the step down, how fine you want the cutter to step. You can also go and clean up, put a tool pad to clean up the flat if necessary. And you can also do uh, any additional options in here and then pick generate. So you have a lot of options and control that is available to you uh, in uh, Visual Mail. The Pro Configurations offers more advanced three axis machining methods. You're not just limited to uh, parallel finishing or horizontal finishing. So this is a Z-level finishing. As you notice here, it's doing a constant Z-level finishing. So it goes around uh, each of those uh, you know, contours. It's even doing the outermost contour. If you want to exclude the outermost contour, I can pick a region that's slightly offset from the outer edge, and that will automatically avoid that uh, from being cleaned up again. So there's the... Okay horizontal finishing toolpath. And uh, we can go back and apply other toolpath methods. So for example, in this area here, I can pick this and use a method called three axis, uh, 3D offset pocketing. So this is known as a constant step over machining or also known as a constant scallop machining method. And you can uh, use this by picking boundaries. You can choose, uh, you wanna start inside, work your way towards the model, you can specify a step over. So that'll create a constant 3D step over machining toolpath method. So look at the very fine details that you can achieve with the toolpath method. So that's called 3D offset pocketing. And I can apply to multiple different operations, multiple different features. I can go back in here and repick. I could say I want to apply to this geometry right in here. I can pick this and this. Um, and I can apply it to that. We also have methods like called between curve machining. So the toolpath will actually morph or flow between the two curves. So there are several different techniques how we can create the toolpath. So I will give you a quick overview of the between two curves where I can pick a curve and define them as machining regions in here. So this will allow me to pick the start point and the direction for the curves. So I'm going to create two curve regions in here by selecting these two. And you can see there's two curves but the two curves are going and flowing in opposite directions. So I'm going to take this one and move the start point somewhere closer to this right here, closer to the other one, line it up right there. And if you take a look at this, they're right by each other right there, but I need to flip the direction, reverse the direction of one of these curves. So I want to make sure both of them are flowing in the same direction. So now I will generate what is called a three axis between two curve machining and I will select these two curve regions in here, and we'll still use the same tool, and I can specify a step over in here. So the toolpath will actually flow or between the two curves. So it uses the two curves for the, for the pattern of the toolpath, but then it's projected down to the 3D model. It follows along the 3D model. So you have different ways, different techniques from which how we can machine this part. You can control the uh, step overs. You, can, you have a lot of different options how we can do it. So you can see, notice right there, you can select these chain of curves as well by using uh, curve edge regions in here. I can pick, um, I can use a shift key and select the chain of edges in here around the model. So you can select the entire chain as you notice it right there. And I can go back in here 
and select this chain around the model as well. And now I can generate the between two curve machining toolpath. So that toolpath will flow between the two curves. So there are several different ways how these toolpaths can be generated. Hey, I so, saw, noticed on your right, see on the upper left hand corner of that pocket? Yeah, the curves are twisted in there, the region. So I need to go back and redo the curve regions that are a little bit twisted. So let me show you how I can correct them. And you can go back and machine it very efficiently here. So uh, if you notice these curves in here, each of these curves have a direction in the start point. So I can display those two curve direction and start points in here. As you notice it right here, uh, let me go back to this layer. Hide this one right here. So I need to move the start point and the direction so they flow in the same area. So for example, I pick this one here. I'm gonna go to curve modeling, move the start point over. I'm lining it up right here. And I'll pick this curve and I'll reverse the direction of the curve. Um, this reverse direction right there. So now I reversed it. I will go back into this between two curve machining operation in here. And I'm going to select the curves. We'll pick this one right here. And we'll pick the one on the inside right there. So the two curves are flowing in the same direction. So now when you generate the toolpath, it's just going to be between these two and not cutting in there. Huh. And it's cutting that face as well. Oh, no, no. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, the face was already machined in the pocket operation, so you can see how nicely right. it's flowing between the two. Okay. Now, when it comes over, is it like a constant Z step down, or as the contour changes, it changes the step? It maintains a uniform step over here. It's flowing. It's using between two curves. It's morphing between the two curves. That's a uniform okay. step over. So if you do the 3D huh. offset pocketing, then this is a constant scallop machining or constant 3D step over, this one. Okay. All right. So there's different techniques so, in how you want to machine it. Okay. And so on the parallel finishing, which is what I probably use most. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just it's a constant X, Y step over. So if you do a parallel finishing on the same set of areas in here, I do a parallel finishing, we'll grab the same tool. We'll use a similar cutting conditions in here. So it basically does a rastering back and forth following the 3D model. So you'll see that when you have areas that are going across, you may have to go, you'll end up with more scalloping here. So you may have to change the direction, change the angle from, right. for example, zero to 90. So cut oh. across to be able to, uh, you know, eliminate some of those scalloping. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I misspoke. I meant because I don't, we don't have a this parallel finishing option. We just use Z and I'm pretty happy with that. Okay. So, but I wanted to make sure that there was... Yeah, so sure. we have Z-level finishing, parallel finishing, 3D offset uh, pocketing, uh, between curve machining. So there's a lot of different ways how we can do it. Okay, so so in summary, then the the horizontal finishing will do a constant step over. Or constant a, Z. A, constant Z. Constant Z. Yeah. So in the case of horizontal finishing, when you have areas that are not too steep, shallow, uh, you wouldn't see cutting over there. So if you do the 3D offset pocketing, then this is a constant 3D step over. So it does X, Y, and Z, not just X, Y, or Z. Right, and that's what I want right there. Is that right. Kind of... Yep, this oh, is called okay. uh, 3D offset pocketing, or also known as con constant scallop machining or constant step over machining. It's called different okay. ways. Yeah. Okay. So you can program all of these features. Once you're done programming, you can, you know, if you want to suppress some of these operations out, so for example, I don't need the parallel finishing, I can select them and do a suppress on it. So those are suppressed out. You can go ahead and uh, take a look at the machining time, right click and information will give you estimated time for machining for each of these. So depending on what we put in for the you know, feeds and speeds, so you can see that the roughing is taking a lot of time in here, we can go back and optimize it, right? Some of these operations, yeah. it gives you, yeah, you can re-optimize it time for machining feeds and speeds and you know once you're ready to post it you right click and post uh, you choose where you want it to be saved automatically uh, you know uses the name of your file for you and then uh, the posted code will appear in your uh, text editor which could be notepad uh, wordpad in a word or any text editor nc editor you can output it right there okay now when it's in the, in the post when it's uh transitioning from one tool to another or one strategy from another could we have it automatically put a comment in the yeah, so in the, in the post processor uh, we have the option to output comments so if you take a look at the posted output file
you will see that the name of the machining operations are being output at the start of each operation. So you can see that the first operation right here. Okay, good. And then if I do a search, uh, it shows the next operation. It's a standard drill, uh, turns off the spindle, grabs the next tools, turns the spindle back on, and there it starts the cutting right there for the drill operation. Uh, so you can look at the uh, tool changes, or if they, even if there isn't a tool change, you go from one operation to the other, it'll output a comment for each. And uh, if you want to output any additional comments, you can just go right here. If you want to do like an optional stop, let's say you want to go from one to the other, and you can right click, go down to properties, you can specify a comment to output. If you want to output as a G code, you can just add a dollar as a prefix sign, so it'll skip the comment characters, like the parentheses or whatever that is, and output it just as a regular line of G code. Okay. And uh, you had a question about uh, shop documentation. So right click, shop documentation. Uh, we have uh, four different template types. So we have an Excel template as well, and we have additional template types. So you can pick one of these templates, and uh, you know the templates can be customized. Uh, they're using standard HTML, uh, uh, you know, tags. So if you're familiar with XML programming, you you'd be able to customize the kind of you know modify the uh, cell spacing or width, or you can reorder some of the information in there. So uh, there's uh, you know. Uh, some control available in customizing your templates. Um, it outputs a tool list. Uh, all of this information comes out in the template. And if you have a, um, a print as PDF, if you have a PDF converter or something, you can save it out as a PDF. We do not generate a PDF directly out of the shop doc, but you you can do a file, uh, you know, use save as or print to a PDF. So there are several, uh, you know, or probably even open source PDF converters available out there. Okay. You okay. can also can put the put tool in list in your G code if you'd like to as well. Okay. And I can put um, <clears throat> uh, I can put in my own comments before we generate this shop document. Yes. So or is if you go into the operation and if you right click on an operation and go to properties, you can type in a comment here. So. Uh, Use uh, carbide uh, or you know zero zero out at southwest corner. So if I put this in here, when I do a shop doc, you will notice that um, this information is output. Um, So it's cycling through each and every uh, operation in here, and uh, the comment will show up right here. You see that, sir? So you can type oh, in gotcha. for each tool, each operation, you can put in a comment. Hmm. Now, I could have okay. put this on the work zero. Uh, I just put in the first operation, so just okay. an oversight here. Okay. There are any other questions I can help you? Uh, no, that's good. Now, as far as um, like, say we have uh, multiple parts, and I I wanted to uh, cut multiple parts out of a a single sheet. Let's say this multi-bodied part. Can I move these around, or would I have to kind of just use my brain and and uh, do the the work offsets on every one of them? And uh, you can have that. multiple parts uh, laid out in here. You can drag and drop them to arrange them and orient it to the way you want it. You can place them in, define a four by eight sheet, and you can program all of them at once. Okay. So, okay, so the, the ones that we have hidden here, we can move those around? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I can okay. go into, uh, and then I can drop them down in the Z. I can do them. I can place them, pick and place them the way I want it. Okay. And one of the nice things I want to point out here is if you have a very powerful feature called knowledge base, so the entire workflow that you did here, if you're working on other parts that have similar workflow, you can take this and save this out to a knowledge base. So it basically saves the entire workflow operations with the tool, the parameters, the feeds and speeds, the cutting parameters, all the things that you dialed in, it's saved to a knowledge base. And then on the other project, you can just load them back in here and it'll automatically read all of the information for you. And then you just have to go back and either select some machining geometry or maybe make some finer adjustments and post it out to your machine. Okay. 
So on these operations, when the next time I open that dialogue, uh, do they have default values or do they just retain what you did last time? So if you edit one of these, it'll have the values that you put in. If you start out a new operation, it'll load from a default, uh, whatever is the factory default setting. However, you can custom and set your default. So for example, take a look at the roughing operation here. We put in certain parameters in here, right? So if you want this to be as a default, you right click and choose save as default. So it'll write it to the default. So the next time you create a new operation in any project from the menu, it'll load from the defaults that you've created. Great, perfect, okay. Okay. So let's take a quick look at how I can move some of the parts in here just to give you a quick, uh, you know, overview so that way you feel, um, uh, you know, comfortable and confident with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go back in here. Uh, I have some of these selected. So let's say I want to grab this part right here, right? And I can use the uh, graphical manipulator and I could say I wanted to drag this over, right? And okay. I can I can place it wherever I need to. Uh, I can select this piece right here, and I can drag it down in the Z to wherever I want to place it. I can even do precise placement. I can say pick this point and put it on Z zero or wherever that needs to be done. So that's how easy it is to move it. So I can now check. Uh, I can say this piece I want to put it back to the other layer. So I can grab all of this in here, and I can change the layer name as well. I could say I want to add a new layer, pick a color for the layer in here. I'll apply green and then take this uh, component, what I've selected, and I'm going to say put it from the move it from the default layer to the new layer. So I have the second piece in here, and now with the second piece, I can specify where I want this to be placed. Uh, so I can line up, if it's the same thickness in here, I can line it up so I can say analyze uh, distance. I can go from here and down to the bottom most point. So that's uh, 1.5, as you can see, it's slightly uh, thicker than what it, in the previous part was, right? So I can go back yep. and say uh, I wanted to select this particular part. So I can drag a window to select this one. And now I can say I want to line up the bottom of this part to the bottom of this part. So I can do a transform move. And uh, I'm going to use this uh, move command in here and say pick from point. I want to pick the bottom most point in here. Uh, you may have to flip this part over, right? So because right. I, okay, so I can pick the bottom most point right there, and then pick two point. Is I want to pick the bottom most point right over here, and I only want to do a Z transformation. So I zero out X and Y, so it automatically puts it in the same Z as the other one. And if you want this to be flipped over, I can select this uh, part and then flip it over by 180 degrees. So I can use the controls uh, using the graphical manipulator. I can say I want to go 180. That's flipped over, and I can move it down in the Z. So you have all of these controls to do it. Good. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Uh, do you have any other questions okay. before we wrap up the demonstration? No, we're pretty good. And actually, do you remember uh, Dave Teeters from Air Motive? He's got the Rhino version. Yes. Um, he, spoke, he, uses he spoke very. <laughs> Yeah, he spoke very highly of you. We we got him into SolidWorks and we got him on his router, and he's loving it. And he's he's telling me all about how awesome Rhino is and how awesome you are. Oh, thank him. you. And uh, that definitely helps, right? So you have a yeah. one of our customers uh, who is uh, using our product every day in their uh, you know workflow, and you know you actually see you know seeing is believing it. So he's basically prove to you that uh, how happy he is with using our product and uh, you know uh, he's a great customer and uh, yeah we do offer very uh, very good technical support so it's exceptional one of the industry's best support what we offer here yeah yeah it seems that way okay uh, good I think um, I've got all my concerns 